I'm Lisa Falk, Head of Community Engagement at the Arizona State Museum, and I'll serve as your host this afternoon. As many of you know, the museum is part of the University of Arizona, located in Tucson. We are on the ancestral lands of the Tonawatham and Pascoyaki nations. The museum's collection and research focuses on the indigenous peoples of the Southwest and Northwest Mexico, and we present programs uh, exploring the history and cultures of this region. Uh, because of COVID, obviously, um, the museum, unfortunately, is currently closed to the public. Um, but just before we closed, we opened an exhibit called A History of Walls, The Borders We Build. And unfortunately, you can't get in to see it, but most of the exhibit, the script is online um, and some of the images. It just has the main script. Um, there are other border stories in it, but the principal border stories that it talks about are the Berlin Wall, the U.S.-Mexico Wall, the Palestinian Israeli barrier fence and the Great Wall of China. Um, and, and we've done programs related to um, all of these walls, but the Great Wall of China. This series of talks is offered in conjunction um, with the exhibit and with support from the Arizona Humanities. And the speakers present various perspectives on the history and current reality of various border barriers. In addition, we have two talks next month that delve into interpreting the border through uh, song, and photography and writing, um, and fiction in particular, and corridos for the songs. Um, the exhibit raises questions and our speakers are addressing such questions as what were and what are these walls meant to do? What did they mean in the beginning and what do we understand them to mean now? How have people interacted with these walls and how do these barriers affect people, the environment and cultural practices as well as tribal sovereignty and cooperation among nations. This afternoon, the sixth talk in the series is a panel presentation about the invisible borders of reservations, tribal treaties, and sovereignty. The first speaker will be Miriam Jorgensen. She is a research director of both the United, University of Arizona Native Nations Institute and its sister organization, the Harvard Project on American Indian Economic Development. Dr. Jorgensen will introduce the idea of invisible borders within the United States, pointing out that the inherent authority and intergovernmental recognition of Native nations governments actually means that many of us would cross the borders of tribal nations and to some extent fall under the jurisdiction on a daily basis, maybe not during a pandemic, but generally. Following Dr. Jorgensen will be Karen Diver, chairwoman of the Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Chippewa, Chairwoman Diver is currently Director of Business Development for the Native American Initiatives at the University of Arizona. She will illustrate how tribal definitions of homelands are more expansive than the boundaries created by reservations and share how tribes exert their governance. We will conclude the presentations with Dr. Kelsey Leonard. Dr. Leonard is a member of the Shenanoff Nation. She is Assistant Professor in the Faculty of Environment at the University of Waterloo in Canada. She will discuss a path to water citizenship and the imagined bordering of, of environmental governments in the face of global climate crisis. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Jorgensen. Thank you so much, Lisa. I'm just gonna get ready to share my screen here. Okay. I'm gonna start in a very similar place to where Lisa started, which is um, with a land acknowledgement, which you'll see here um, that the University of, located is, of Arizona is located on the homelands of the Tanata Nation and on the land of the Pascayaki people. That's really important for the talk that we are giving today uh, because it, it acknowledges that there are native lands that we might not always be aware of by seeing the wall, by seeing the border, but um, as Lisa said, in a non-pandemic period, many of us are crossing onto these lands all the time, um, either onto their precise reservations or onto the broader homelands of these nations. I wanted to start also with a map uh, that many of you may be familiar with. I realize that many of the folks tuned in to this uh, webinar are not necessarily from Arizona, um, but that's where we're located. We'll, so we'll start there and move outward from it. Arizona shares geography with 22 tribes, with 22 native nations, with 22 indigenous nations that have inherent sovereignty that is uh, exists as prior to and um, is separate from the sovereignty of the United States and the sovereignty of the state of Arizona. And each one of those tribes, each one of those native nations 
has a recognized land base that has um, uh, a line that can be drawn on a map, as you see here. And that's not true, obviously, just in Arizona, but across the United States. So you see here um, the, the colorful markings are uh, the recognized land bases of uh, federally recognized tribes in the continental United States. Uh, and some of those land bases are very large. And here's a, an image showing the recognized uh, land bases. They're dots, um, which are the native villages in Alaska. There's a different land holding pattern there, but there are still native lands associated with each of those villages. So to go back to this point that there are over, that there are 574 federally recognized tribes in the United States, all have land bases that create boundaries and borders and those um, invisible borders that lack walls, but that one would cross onto and off of when traversing the United States. Uh, 326 American Indian Native Reservations, that doesn't count um, the villages in Alaska that uh, have also land bases that are not technically reservations, but also are under their control. I think something that many of us don't think about were in the federal context, but particularly in the south and eastern part of the United States, there are 63 state recognized tribes, many of which also are land holding tribes and would have um, a land base over which jurisdiction is asserted. And more than that, there are numerous land areas separate from reservations over which uh, tribes have a degree of authority. So throughout this presentation, my own and that of former Chairwoman Diver and Dr. Leonard, you're going to get a sense of what that jurisdiction means and what it means to have these invisible boundaries that are potentially reservation boundaries, which are these recognized land bases and other kinds of boundaries. So let's delve into that a little bit in an introductory fashion. As Lisa noted in the introduction that she gave for me, I wanted to ground my remarks in the notion of indigenous nation sovereignty. An indigenous nation sovereignty is that in, uh, inherent authority, as I said before, inherent, that pre-existing, pre-United States, um, coming from uh, being here as original peoples, that inherent authority of indigenous nations to govern themselves. That's what indigenous nation sovereignty is. Uh, indigenous nation sovereign authority extends to indigenous nations' lands, its citizens, and subjects matters over which they have vested interest. And so these, this notion of invisible bear boundaries and invisible borders links to sovereignty and is a, a applicable to all of us in the sense that when an indi individual, whether or not you're a citizen of that nation, you cross on to native lands, there is that inherent authority that an indigenous nation would have over all of us, any of us um, for particular issues. Um, so I think it's important to think about the fact that um, indigenous nation authority isn't just over the individuals who are citizens of that nation, but over anybody who crosses onto those lands um, and who would be subject to certain kinds of jurisdiction. And we'll ex explore that more in a little bit. Of course, settler colonial governments have infringed upon indigenous nation authority. Um, so it's greater in some domains than in others but it nonetheless persists. And again, that's something that I wanna just stress around this notion of invisible borders and barriers. We oftentimes aren't thinking about um, the jurisdictional and, uh, authority and the inherent sovereign authority of tribes, but it's always there, it's been there, and it will continue to be there, sort of regardless of that settler colonial um, US government, state government, municipal government overlay of authorities as well. Oftentimes we think of these things as overlapping authorities or overlapping jurisdictions or shared jurisdictions. Uh, so um, just because a non-Indigenous government also has authority in an area doesn't make Indigenous authority go away. So let's get down to some brass tacks. What does that mean when you're crossing these borders and becoming subject to some of those authorities if you are not a citizen of that Native nation? The Native Nation Reservation of Border ends up affecting which civil laws apply to you. For instance, what's, who gets to set the speed limit for that area? Um, what animal control laws apply? Um, even things like um, it could also determine for Indigenous Nation citizens themselves which marriage laws apply and things like that. It can have an effect on which criminal laws apply and to whom. Um, certainly settler colonial law says that right now, 
um, most non-Indigenous people or non-tribal citizens on tribal lands aren't subject to the criminal laws of the tribe, but those um, issues are changing slowly. Those of you who followed closely the Violence Against Women Act amendments know that some tribes now are actually exercising criminal authority over individuals who um, commit acts of domestic violence and harm against um, uh, tribal citizens. So this, this jurisdictional uh, blanket and boundary is sort of um, shifting and changing uh, depending on the, uh, the relationship that tribes have with other governments as well. But it also applies to more mundane things like which government is responsible for providing things like um, or managing things like emergency services or even basic services like water, electricity and broadband. So these invisible boundaries, again, that aren't typical marked with typically marked with walls or with other kinds of fences or visible borders have a lot of consequence in the way that people uh, live their lives and how they, uh, what authorities they interact with. The issues around which borders matter um, are actually in constant flux. And it goes back to that point that I was saying that uh, the relationship between indigenous nations and the settler colonial government, that is the US government, the state governments, the municipal and county governments uh, is in a sense, a, a constant negotiation. And one of the recent negotiations we've seen is that that came out of the uh, Supreme Court decision in McGirt versus Oklahoma, uh, which came down uh, earlier this year. And it held that for um, matters of criminal jurisdiction, the Muscogee Creek Reservation, which had been established in the middle of the 19th century or the even the earlier part of the 19th century pre-Civil War had not been disestablished for purposes of criminal jurisdiction. That's a pretty narrow ruling, but uh, there's been a lot of cascading discussion that's come from it, suggesting that it might be consequential, this decision might be consequential, not just for criminal jurisdiction, but for other matters as well. And so this is one of those places where there's an ongoing negotiation uh, between the tribe and the federal government, between the tribe and the other tribes that have a similar um, his history as the Muscogee Creek and between the tribe and the government of the state of Oklahoma. So these boundaries matter and the interpretation of those boundaries is something that is a constant uh, part of conversation and negotiation as time goes on. They're not necessarily set and fixed. Just to point that out a little bit more, I wanted to discuss the fact that one of the reasons they're not set and fixed uh, is that indigenous people's conception of what those borders are, what those boundaries are, can be different from non-Indigenous people's conceptions. And that goes back to that notion of inherent sovereignty and inherent authority that pre-exists that of the United States. Um, and it goes back to the notion of responsibilities that Indigenous peoples have to land, um, to animals, to non-human people, to the environment. Um, and I wanted to just uh, draw a picture here that might help drive some of this point home. The dark blue area here and this is taking us way up north to the Nez Perce um, the reservation, which uh, uh, shares a geography with the state of Idaho. The dark blue landmass is the current Nez Perce reservation. But if you look at the light, the middle light blue landmass, that's the original boundary of the reservation that was established by treaty in 1855. So a much larger area. Uh, so if you're the Nez Perce people and you did not agree to the diminishments that created the much smaller reservation boundary of today, your sense might be that your actual treaty area, your actual reservation is the originally established reservation. And that's an area over which you ought to by US law as well as by Nez Perce law ought to have some degree of authority. So which boundary, which barrier or which um, border is the relevant border, is it the dark blue one or the lighter blue one? And finally, I think it raises the question of this final lightest blue segment, which is the original Nez Perce homeland to raise the question of maybe that's really the consequential set of borders or boundaries that really matter to the Nez Perce people in terms of thinking about where their responsibilities lie to care for country, to care for animals, to care for people, to care for um, the broad array of responsibilities that they have um, 
in their territory. So again, these interpretations of what the actual boundary or border is can vary depending on who you are and where you sit and what your sense of um, territory and homeland is. Increasingly, we're aware of this in the United States. I think we're a little bit behind where a lot of the other um, settler colonial nations like Canada, Australia, and New Zealand have been. For a long time, there's been an acknowledgement in public spaces like this one, where people would say, as Lisa did to start this, that um, the University of Arizona is located on the homelands of the Tanakam people and on the lands of the Pasquayaki tribe. Um, we didn't used to say that all the time in the United States, but um, other countries have come, come that far and said that, but we're getting better. Uh, more and more of us are acknowledging in these public forums that anywhere we are in North America, we're on indigenous lands and we're trying to be very careful to identify what those lands are. So if you're curious about this, about whose lands you're on and um, where who the original people of that space were, I think this website nativeland.ca is a useful one. It's not perfect. It doesn't have everything right but it does drive home several points of reservations themselves aren't the only lands over which indigenous people um, might have a degree of authority or do have a degree of authority. Um, because all of this was indigenous space, there are indigenous lands everywhere and it pays to know whose lands um, they are in a sense and um, to acknowledge that and to, to, to take that awareness into a, a public sphere. There's another thing that this map points out though. And I think that it um, shows kind of uh, in a rough fashion because it's a little bit like a, a Rorschach uh, uh, presentation, but it shows you that these notions of land and boundary and areas of responsibility are overlapping. That indigenous peoples didn't necessarily have the same and don't still necessarily have the same notions of tight land boundaries that we tend to have in that Westphalian nation state kind of sense that there was has long been a notion that there can be overlapping boundaries and overlapping areas of responsibility. Um, and that's something also to be aware of in thinking about those boundaries and borders of indigenous lands. So I've just tried there to open up um, a few ideas to introduce this, this talk for this evening. Uh, and just emphasize these few points um, to maybe help you think about the two presentations that are to follow, that by former Chairwoman Diver and that by Dr. Leonard, that Native nations borders may not be marked with a fence or with a wall, but they still exist and they're consequential. Exactly what they are um, varies uh, depending on which land you're talking about and what uh, what kind of legal framework you're coming from, an indigenous legal framework, a Western legal framework. Um, but it pays to think about the fact that these reservation, territorial, and issue boundaries exist and persist across the United States. And finally, they have and should have consequences for all of us. They may be slightly different consequences if you're actually physically on reservation land or off reservation land, or if you're dealing with an issue toward which indigenous people have a deeper sense and broad sense of responsibility, but these boundaries matter and they matter in our everyday lives. Um, whether or not there's something that's really visible or invisible, they have consequence. I'll end there and just say thank you um, and uh, turn things over to Chairwoman Diver and Dr. Leonard for a deeper dive. Thank you, Dr. Jorgensen. Um, so my name is Karen Diver. Um, I am a citizen of the Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior, Chippewa. For my land acknowledgement, I am joining you from my homelands in Northern Minnesota. Um, we are near Lake Superior, just south and west of Duluth, Minnesota. Um, the Fond du Lac Band of um, Lake Superior, Chippewa is one of six Anishinaabe, which is another name for Chippewa um, bands in Minnesota. And we are joined by relatives all over Wisconsin, um, Michigan, um, Canada, um, and actually North Dakota, and it keeps going. So um, 
I'm going to share a little bit about Board of Perspectives. So um, I was introduced as the chairwoman. At, that's an honorific. I was the chairwoman for nine years. So it's an emeritus title now. Um, in addition to um, having a leadership role, I'm an elected leadership role in my tribe. I was also the special assistant to the president for Native American affairs under Barack Obama. And so border issues, tribal issues were obviously a part of my portfolio in that role. So what does the kind of border issues look like from the Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Chippewa? We are actually, um, we're initially a coastal tribe. We are water, um, a water tribe, um, but our, our prophecy said that we needed to move um, in order to follow where the food grows on the water. And if we didn't, that we would perish. Um, the food that grows on the water ended up being wild rice. And so this migration happened over um, quite a number of years, um, over a um, hundred years. And we stopped at various places along the way, both north and south to the US border in Canada. It's split over by Sault Ste. Marie um, with half of the folks going north um, and then half of them following the southern border of Lake Superior. Um, and then we found the food that grows on the water um, and spread into Minnesota. But there are Anishinaabe, Ojibwe people all over Canada um, with reserves on the other side of the border. Um, and those are our relatives. Um, so for my band, um, you can see that we actually had five U.S. treaties that covered the entire U.S. shoreline of Lake Superior. And those were treaties with the U.S. Um, for those of us that were on this side of what became the U.S. border. The final treaty was the Treaty of 1854, which you can see Fond du Lac there um, just off of Lake Superior. Um, but relatives kind of gotten captured um, in encampments along the way. Um, so, you know, I can trace my family and have relatives all over all of those treaty areas. Um, it was just a matter of, um, you know, that's where they were residing when the treaties were made. So I'm gonna focus a bit on the Treaty of um, La Pointe. Um, in 1854, which was the creation of the Fond du Lac Reservation um, and what is traditionally recognized now as homelands. There was language in that treaty that specifically reserved the right to hunt, fish, and gather in traditional ways in the entire what we call ceded territory. That's all of northeastern Minnesota. We were hunter, fisher, gatherers, continue to be, um, and we weren't confined to such a small area. We were also, also traders. Um, that was one of the reasons why we were, um, you know, along Lake Superior is that allowed us to easily navigate um, to have trade relationships with all different kinds of folks. Um, so we have reserved rights to hunt, fish, and gather in this large swath, and that ended up, um, the, the resolution of what they call the Indian issues at this time um, is really what allowed Minnesota beco to become a state. Um, so the creation of the Fond du Lac Reservation on our, our homelands, a small piece of our homelands, um, predates the existence of the state of Minnesota. So all of that border was created after our reservation homelands were there. How does that look when you bring that forward to a modern day um, tribal nation? Um, you see here, Minnesota, um, we have um, two countries. Um, we border Canada. Um, our, some of our relatives are on the other side. They pass back and forth. Um, we have relationships um, with communities up there. Um, we have the state of Minnesota, obviously, and I'm only addressing Minnesota issues, not the other treaties where we do have equities. Um, so just that one treaty, we deal with the one state. Um, the borders of Fond du Lac has two counties, one city, seven townships, and three school districts. So from a modern day political perspective, operating as a government, a sovereign government, as um, Dr. Jorgensen said, 
within my purview as chairwoman, those are all of the intergovernmental relationships that I had to maintain. Um, and this is not even talking about the federal government and the 27 different federal agencies that have equities in what we call Indian country. Um, so all of them have you know, various responsibilities. We have county sheriffs, two sets of county sheriffs, um, one city police force. We have these school districts that um, educate our children um, that we have to maintain relationships with. Um, and then the state of Minnesota, obviously around managing treaty resources and those rights to hunt, fish and gather. So when we talk about jurisdiction, um, jurisdiction over what as a tribal chairwoman? And these are really complex relationships. Um, and sometimes you're dealing with them at a really granule, granular level. Um, within the borders, um, we have, we can set hunting, fishing, and gathering guidelines for our tribal members. Um, we have to work in concert with the state um, over non-natives within our borders and in that larger ceded territory. On the other hand, there's issues like air and water quality where the um, Fond du Lac Band has delegated water authority um, much like a state would under the Clean Water Act and the Clean Air Act. And we worked really hard with the EPA to get that um, delegated status. It's called treatment as an affected state. So we set water quality standards within our borders. Um, we regulate things like discharges from septic systems and setbacks um, and things like that. And we can enforce those on non-tribal citizens as well, because you can't change what happens to the water quality based on um, you know, your, your participation in different political units. It's all the same body of water. Um, so we work interjurisdictionally um, to set those standards and, and to let citizens know. Um, but if enforcement takes place, um, you know, the, the band has that right to tell people you need to disconnect your septic, um, et cetera. Air quality is a little different because it co covers a broader swath because um, we can go outside of our borders around air quality issues um, because it off reservation sources could impact um, on reservation. The band is now um, exploring whether or not they should set air quality standards, um, class one airspace, which would be the same as like a national park standard. Um, it created some difficulty, frankly, interjurisdictionally, where other jurisdictions, their economic development arms, um, their chambers of commerce were worried that it was going to inhibit um, economic development, um, even though um, we've got very few industries um, in rural Minnesota um, that take on that kind of um, manufacturing or other things that would have that. Land use and zoning, um, the, the band has a very robust land use and zoning um, ordinance. That is because we wanna maintain um, traditional life ways. Um, and the, one of the ways you protect air and water quality is to make sure that your development is really smart, um, that we're thinking ahead. Um, you know, we know where we're willing to develop, where we're not, whether it's housing, whether it's commercial. Um, and then we have land set aside for habitat, um, as well as for traditional uses like fish camps, maple sugar, berries, um, and then obviously our water um, for things like wild rice. Criminal and civil regulatory issues um, end up, Miriam checked on that a, a, a bit around civil regulations and Fond du Lac operates a tribal court. It exerts civil regulatory jurisdiction over its own citizens in a number of areas, um, small claims, truancy, um, hunting and fishing, um, things like that. Criminal jurisdiction, we are, um, work with the state of Minnesota, we're what's called a public law 280 state, meaning the federal government um, has mandated that um, state jurisdiction over criminal matters apply on tribal lands within Minnesota. Um, so we worked interjurisdictionally. We have our own police force, um, but they actually um, will be charged into the state court systems. So, what else makes these interjurisdictional issues even more complicated is the status of the land within the borders. 
This is a map showing um, land ownership within the Fond du Lac band and, and Fond du Lac is what's called a checkerboarded reservation. And that is that over the years, um, in the early 1800s, the Dawes Indian or the late 1800s, the Dawes Indian Allotment Act was passed, which created um, designated plots of land for individual Indian owners. And then anything that was left over, the federal government deemed it as surplus. Um, an Indian um, head of the Indian agency at the time said this was nothing more than a land grab within the borders of the reservation. Fond du Lac lost over 80% of the lands within the borders and has slowly been reclaiming it. Some of the lands are still he held by those uh, uh, original allottees, um, but now there's heirs numbering in the three to 5,000 um, because it doesn't get passed down to a single heir, it gets passed down to all of the heirs, especially when there's no um, probate issues um, settled in advance. It was one of the other ways that tribes lost land because if you had a non-native spouse, it immediately became non-native land. So you'll hear about tribes and land reclamation within the borders, which means they're buying it back on the market um, and then they have to apply to the federal government to have it be made a part of the reservation again. And that's a anywhere from a three to 10 year process to have the federal government say that those lands are now reservation lands again. And even then the tribe does not own it outright. It's actually held by the federal government on our behalf. So those are federal lands and follow federal jurisdictions unless the tribe is exerting its own sovereignty and governance. So um, you'll see just on this, this um, slide that the white parts are fee simple land, meaning private land. Um, and then you see the various um, different categories of allotment, tribal, um, et cetera, um, federal land, state park lands, et cetera. So it is a kind of a complicated uh, bit of interjurisdictional relationships just to manage the remaining homelands that we have left. And then if that weren't enough, then we have this thing called the Jay Treaty, um, which recognized that the US Canadian border um, didn't exist for indigenous peoples, that that was created um, kind of artificially after we already had homelands all around Lake Superior um, and all of the Great Lakes. And the Jay Treaty um, actually is something that recognizes that and is still being implemented today. Unfortunately, it's only implemented for um, Canadian indigenous coming into the US, which allows them free passage and allows them to be able to go to school, work um, without all of the um, rigor um, that's currently being put into place around immigration. Unfortunately, all of the issues around immigration have been impacting the Jay Treaty and it has been um, increasingly difficult to have that free passage even though um, it's been going on since 1794. Um, it's inconsistent at best at the moment, um, but it is supposed to recognize that um, us as peoples um, really were impacted by the creation of the two political entities, the US um, and Canada. Anyway, so that's a little bit about tribal nations um, along the Great Lakes and a little bit of the practical part of actually being a tribal leader and having to navigate um, when all of these other borders by other jurisdictions are kind of imposed upon our homelands um, and how we manage our resources. Now I'll turn it over to Dr. Leonard so she can tell you more about water. Okay, Akwe, hello everyone. Uh, hopefully you're having a great day. My name is Dr. Kelsey Leonard. I'm a citizen of the Shinnecock Nation. I'll tell you a little bit more about our territory in, in a moment, but also wanted to acknowledge that I am zooming in, calling in from Southern Ontario, Canada uh, this afternoon, evening here. For, uh, for today's session. And I'm on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabek and Haudenosaunee peoples. So uh, thank you to uh, the Honorable Chairwoman Diver for showing you a little bit about the region that I uh, am now living and 
or working in. So we got to learn a little bit of, of, of the Anishinaabek peoples and their history and story in this part of the world. So from my presentation today, I want to go over with you a few ideas, emerging concepts related to our current climate crisis and, and the very difficult environmental challenges that we're facing globally, as well as provide hopefully a path forward, thinking through uh, an emerging concept called water citizenship and what that might mean both on individual scales as well as a global scale when we start to think about borders and transboundary environmental concerns, such as the climate crisis. As you can see on the screen here um, and, and through the slides, I have uh, two Twitter accounts, one which is my uh, uh, professional account for uh, Kelsey T. Leonard. So throughout this conversation, feel free to tweet me. Um, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, to follow up with future conversations over Twitter. But I also have another account uh, that I manage called uh, Indigenous Waters. Um, it's at Tribal Water. And it really is a new source of all of the sort of emerging water issues and indigenous water rights concerns that are facing indigenous nations around the world. So I just wanted to kind of put that at the front, the forefront for our conversation uh, today. So uh, as I mentioned, I wanted to talk with you a little bit about where I'm from. So I'm a citizen of the Shinnecock Nation. Uh, we are a federally recognized tribe based in what's currently known as the United States and our traditional territory is um, on the southern shores or eastern end of what we call Pominock, uh, what, what's currently known as Long Island uh, in the state of, uh, that's currently known as New York. And so for us, we are a coastal Algonquin um, indigenous nation. We really, you can see here in this slide, um, we, our territory is right you know, on the Atlantic Ocean. We are, are sort of a peninsula, so we're, our existing reservation is surrounded on three sides by water. And uh, we are known for our history of being uh, bay people, baymen, bay women, uh, fishermen, uh, shellfish folks, and particularly for our harvesting and production of, of wampum, which is, for those that aren't familiar, it's one of the original um, currencies for the United States of America, but also one of the original uh, tools or, or constitutions for treaty relationships for uh, both in the United States and, and Canada. So wampum belts carved out of, uh, made out of wampum beads that are carved out of quahog and whelk shells that are harvested from Eastern shores of what's currently known as the United States and Canada. So for me, I now in my research and practice is very much situated in indigenous water governance and looking at how do we think through addressing some of the major global crises uh, facing our planet in, in the environmental realm by utilizing and, and championing indigenous conservation practices and indigenous science in, in, in developing these solutions and addressing these concerns. And I think that that's really important when we're talking about borders and boundaries and because in a lot of ways, water, the environment, it, it doesn't recognize these, these invisible borders that we've established, these uh, societal boundaries and borders that we've created, because that's really at the, at the heart of what a border is. It's a function and tool, particularly a legal mechanism created by humans for the governance of, of human activity. It doesn't really inform or, uh, or relate to how we understand and connect to the natural world. And I think that that's something that we are really starting to grapple with as a global community, the challenges that the, these borders that we've created pose to us when we're dealing with a global climate crisis that doesn't really respect borders. And so, you know, for me being, you know, from a coastal uh, indigenous nation, this is even more pronounced because we are literally on the front lines of climate change. We are, you know, being daily impacted by rising sea levels, by shoreline erosion, uh, by storm surge and extreme climate events, as we saw in uh, uh, about maybe five or so years ago now with Superstorm Sandy and even more frequency of large storm climatic events, uh, particularly hurricanes on the eastern shores of Long Island. So 
as you can see from the slide as well, uh, there are these sort of boundaries that, you know, the sort of small purple here are the boundaries of our existing reservation. Um, all of Eastern Long Island was our traditional homeland territory. And as was explained earlier, for some folks, you may have a popular understanding of a reservation as a place to which uh, indigenous peoples were removed to. But what's unique for Shinnecock, and I think also as Chairwoman Diver explained for Fond du Lac, is we are currently still existing on our indigenous homeland. We were never removed. Um, and so what you see now as our existing reservation territory is what we have left after settler encroachment over hundreds of years, if, if not multiple centuries. And so what also kind of compounds our experience uh, on Shinnecock is that we are living uh, amongst the most um, affluent communities in the United States, being uh, the Hamptons, and also sort of the, the second home affluence of the United States, where we really are uh, surrounded by vacation homes, second homes, folks who uh, make the Hamptons their summer uh, playhouse and, and playground for, uh, for their escape from uh, urban um, lifestyles uh, in New York City or, or other places around the world and come to just enjoy the summertime uh, beauty uh, of our island. That's changed a little bit with COVID and with the pandemic and folks not wanting to go back to densely populated places, but it makes it very, very difficult for us to continue to, uh, to protect our borders and protect our population uh, as we are sort of facing not only climate challenges, but, uh, but density of population challenges and the ways in which those can exacerbate existing climate change concerns. So I love this quote by uh, Secretary General uh, Ban Ki-moon, a former Secretary General for the United Nations, uh, who says that climate change does not respect border. It does not respect who you are, rich and poor, small and big. Therefore, this is what we call global challenges, which require global solidarity. So I think, you know, from where we start at the beginning of this evening to where I hope we will end with is really starting to re-examine and question the establishment of our existing borders and whether or not they will be effective and efficient as we start to think about climate change and, and our global society moving forward, if not for in the next 10 years, but 50 years to 100 years, will these borders still be sufficient? Will these borders still be effective and, and able to be in, enforceable? So for, again, for me, being a Shinnecock person and being an environmental scientist, climate change is at the forefront of these concerns. And for many indigenous communities around the world, as I mentioned, being on the front lines of climate change, we are you know, facing massive challenges that are not something that is 30 years off or 100 years off, but is right now. So as you can see in this slide, this is a, a satellite image of the existing Shinnecock Reservation, this sort of peninsula uh, point, uh, point that you can see here we call the neck of the reservation. There's another portion that's more um, interior, but this is sort of our, our existing homeland as we now maintain it uh, due to you know, centuries of the settler colonial state's encroachment. That being said, you know, we are surrounded on three sides by water and with sea level rise projections, um, if they, I'll show you in a moment, you know, there are different magnitudes of, of what sea level rise could do to our territory. So, if we say in about you know 2050, the red, the images that you're seeing here, what's in red is automatically projected to be land inundated by sea level rise by 2050. If the projections are um, at their maximum level, um, which they may reach by 2100, we would see an inundation to the yellow portion that you're seeing here um, uh, on the map. And so what that means is that by 2050, with, you know, within 30 years from now, we could lose about half of our reservation landmass as, as, it, as it currently exists. And that's very troublesome for an indigenous nation whose population is continuing to grow, who has you know, real cultural ties and, and a political constitution that is based in these southern shores of, of Long Island. So how do we grapple with these imagined borders, these sort of borders that were put in by the colonial state as we're trying to then grapple with climate change. So what that means in more concrete terms is, okay, our reservation may be underwater in 50 years. What do we do? 
Well, one thing that we think of is maybe relocation, uh, finding a place for indigenous nations, particularly within the United States that are going to be impacted by climate, by climate change and by rising sea levels to, to relocate to. But in that process of relocation, we have such a uh, complicated interjurisdictional and legal framework by which indigenous nations can acquire land in the United States that it's actually almost feasibly right now impossible based on the existing legislation for indigenous nations to acquire new land that they can then keep at the same status of their existing land holdings. And so these are pressing challenges when we think about borders and invisible borders, the creation of borders and climate change. And definitely one that my nation is constantly considering and thinking through in the acquisition uh, of new land and thinking through what relocation might look like in the future. This is to say too that we're having to think through all of these changes, all of these aspects of loss of land, loss of, of territory that we have a cultural connection to that can, you know, for many indigenous nations, not just my own, induces a great sense of climate anxiety, climate grief. Uh, there's a lot of studies and scholarship on the, on the mental health impacts of climate change on communities and on individuals. And it's particularly severe for indigenous uh, peoples who are on the front lines. And what's even more horrific about that type of societal induced climate grief, if I may call it that, is because it's being created by humans. You know, if, but for human activity and sort of this new geological age that we find ourselves in of the Anthropocene, my nation might not be facing rising sea levels due to climate change, due to uh, the continued um, carbon emissions that our planet is having to deal with um, and that humans are putting out. And so I think it's, you know, it's a really interesting uh, conversation for us to think through when we start to examine what solutions could be for new borders and, and new imagined understandings of political identity and political jurisdiction in the face of the climate crisis. And it's not just about us as humans. We also have to think about how is this impacting our non-human relations. Again, if we go back to what Secretary General Ban Ki-moon said, the climate crisis, climate change does not recognize borders. And we're really starting to see with the um, World um, Wide Fund for Nature, their Living Planet Report that came out last month, that we've lost about, you know, human activity has contributed to about two thirds of the world's wildlife uh, going extinct since 1970. That is because of us and as human beings and our choices that we've made. And of that, what I thought was really interesting for, uh, that came out of the report, of that loss of uh, planetary life that we've seen since the 1970s, the most traumatic decline has been in freshwater and in freshwater systems. And when we start to think about borders and the, the imagining of borders and the way in which it impacts our non-human relations, we really can start to see that we should be paying more attention to, to our waters and particularly to the way in which we might imagine a new form of bordering or a new form of citizenship that directly ties in to our responsibilities and rights of stewardship for, for nature and particularly for the water. And I think that that's also important because as we start to see you know, non-human relations are kind of our canaries in the mine. They are the beings that are giving us warnings of what's going to befall us as human beings. And right now we can see around the world, there are about 2 billion people, and as you can see on this slide, there are about 2 billion people that live in countries currently experiencing high water stress. That's already, right now in 2020, is the existence of about 2 billion people that don't have access to adequate quantity or quality of water to meet their daily livelihood. And it's projected that in the next 10 years, about 700 million people could be displaced due to water scarcity. And it's not just people that are being displaced, right? We just saw from the w WWF report that our freshwater non-human relations are being displaced. They're giving us warning signs of what's to come in our own 
human future. And so we really have to start to think through what type of climate action, what type of water action can we take to change the tide? And I think it starts with reimagining citizenship. We have a lot of ties right now to our political identities of nation states. We're in the midst of an election in the United States, and we all are advocating for our civic duties to go out and vote. And that's important. That is still going to be very important in how we shape the future of our planet. But I also might challenge you to think about how do you relate? What does your citizenship look like towards water, towards this life force that's important for every being on this planet? Uh, this is a map that was created by a Hungarian geographer, um, Robert Scoot, which I love because it kind of reorients us. The pink that you see here is the connection between rivers and waterways of the Mississippi and the Missouri. The sort of dark orange there in the upper left is the Columbia River Basin. Uh, in your part of the world right now is that yellow, which is the Colorado filtering down uh, into the blue of, of the Rio Grande. And if we started to think about our citizenship and our connection to borders through these riverways, through these waterways, how might that reform or transform our civic duties? We'd have civic duties not only to vote in our political entities and constituents, but we'd have civic duties to the water. We'd have civic duties to the natural world that would inform our relationships and practice of enactment of our responsibilities and stewardship of this part of the planet that we rely on and depend on. And so I think that's really what I'm advocating for in my work and what I see other indigenous nations advocating for when it comes to the climate crisis and really shifting our climate action going into 2021 and also in relation to our existing pandemic. It's about how do we become more nature-centered, water-centered. I love this map because we often talk about oceans, plural. But really, it's just one ocean, it's, and it connects us all. Uh, and this map is really beautiful in the sense that it centers, it's one of the few maps that centers the ocean in our conversations and starts to lead to that transformative thinking that we need around borders and our conceptions and notions of borders. And ultimately, this is to say, and what I want to leave you with, is that we have a choice in the establishment of borders and our understanding of borders we are choosing to acknowledge them. And in the establishment of certain borders, we might be choosing human superiority over the natural world. We might be choosing to have the continued overconsumption and overgrowth of human society to the detriment of the natural world by the establishment and continued uh, defense of our existing borders. And I would challenge you to think if that is really sustainable in our existing climate crisis. Earlier, folks have mentioned the Clean Water Act. The Clean Water Act is a seminal piece of legislation for environmental government, governance in the United States, but it hasn't been modernized since the late 80s. And when we think about climate change, it's not even mentioned in the Clean Water Act. And when we think about the way in which climate change doesn't respect borders, but that the Clean Water Act is very border-centric and very human-centric, how might we rethink borders to modernize the Clean Water Act? How might we also you know, rethink the way in which we individually relate to water? And for myself and for the research that I look into, it's particularly around a concept as I mentioned at the start of our conversation around water citizenship. And really it's a questioning of how are we as individuals and the global society working to protect water, working to ensure that we have certain outlined and delegated responsibilities for towards water that we fulfill on a, a daily basis, and that we're also ensuring that we are transmitting our knowledge of water, the way in which we understand water stewardship and conservation practices to uh, be successful in those sort of bright spots and best practices. How do we make sure that that knowledge is continued to be transmitted across generations for the future success um, and, habit and um, uh, habitability of the planet. So making sure that our planet can remain habitable for future generations, better way of saying it. And lastly, that there is this um, really reformation and transformation of our thinking 
to relationality, to thinking about how can I reestablish a treaty relationship that reforms and maybe even reconstitutes borders for the protection of water through my own individual citizenship that may tie in to a global water citizenship framework. So with that, it was very exploratory and I hope it gives you a chance to think and reflect on your own individual water citizenship and the way in which borders might be exacerbating our current climate crisis. So, Tabutni, thank you. Before you take that down, Kelsey, somebody would like yeah. to see your ocean-centered map one more time. Oh, okay, no problem. I will go to that slide and pull that up for you. And this is actually a map that was created in 1942, uh, a model that was created, and it just doesn't really get a lot of exposure. And I think what's really interesting too that was mentioned earlier is the way in which indigenous nations are presented or not presented on maps. So in particular, the erasure of the ocean, the erasure of waterways, the erasure of indigenous peoples on maps is very, very similar. They're connected. As that erasure is linked to a tool of colonialism. It's, it's a process by which colonialism can be enacted to erase indigenous peoples from that. And unfortunately, the digital world, consciously or unconsciously, has inherited that legacy of colonialism and practices a part of digital, what we call digital colonialism, colonialism now, where um, we are erased from your Google Maps. And so when you type into your GPS, you barely know that you're going through one of our reservations or territories or, or treaty areas because we're just not there. And it's something that I will give credit to Google and, and Esri and other mapping uh, contingencies around the world, they're working to address that, but um, you know, they've had maybe three decades of developing digital maps and, uh, and are maybe in the past five years are really working to try and reform the aspects of digital colonialism that are present in, in our digital maps right now. So we still have a long way to go. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're going to go through the questions now, so um, everybody could put their video back on. Uh, this first question is for Dr. Jorgensen. It says, in regards to criminal jurisdiction on federally recognized Indian land, if a non-Indian commits a crime, is it correct that he or she would not be subject to the criminal jurisdiction of the tribe, but could still possibly be arrested and held for state or federal law enforcement? Uh, the short answer to that question is yes. <laughs> um, so many tribes have uh, arrangements with, uh, tribal governments have arrangements with the state and federal governments to um, make sure that any individuals who have broken the law, um, and in this case, it would be state or federal law on the reservation uh, that they would be uh, uh, transferred to the appropriate authorities. I will say that one of the things that's um, interesting, and this was not part of your question, um, but one of the things that we're seeing uh, in terms of the evolution of jurisdiction and of you know, kind of the meaning of those borders and boundaries is that some tribes have begun to create civil code that actually also applies to um, non-tribal citizens. And those civil codes um, might be for things that in Western non-Indigenous law would be um, criminal citations. Um, but what that civil infraction then allows is for the tribe to have some kind of authority. So one of the things we worry about a lot in the, the notion of borders and criminal jurisdiction is that if there isn't um, a pickup by that other authority, by the state or the federal authority of that, um, uh, of that citation that led to the arrest of that non-tribal citizen, um, then that, that crime or infraction or violation goes away. And that doesn't create a good situation for the tribal government. It has in some instances, particularly in places like the kinds of places that Karen mentioned, which are called PL-280 states, where this, um, the federal government has deputed back to the states this authority of law enforcement for non-Indigenous people on tribal lands that you kind of get these vacuums sometimes of law. And so where a state government then doesn't take the handoff of that um, criminal violation, um, it be oftentimes behooves the tribe to kind of try to figure out how within its jurisdiction it can still exercise some authority and it can do that through the creation of some um, civil laws. Does the Violence Against Women Act change some of that though? 
The Violence Against Women Act does change some of that for tribes that have gone through the process of making sure that they have met the criteria that are laid out in the law for um, when they can enforce against non-Indigenous non or non-tribal citizens. Um, and a number of tribes have um, done that. Um, one of them in our local area, Lisa, is the Pasquayaki tribe has gone through that process and does have that jurisdictional authority to exercise a criminal jurisdiction for that narrow set of cases that um, fall under the Violence Against Women Act um, and to prosecute non-tribal uh, non, non citizens. Another question for you is, how might reservation lands be able to expand in the United States in the future? And Karen, you might want to address this too. Did this occur in Oklahoma with the recent Supreme Court ruling? Karen, I'm happy to let you take that first since I knew you talked a little bit about um, the transfer of, of fee lands into trust. Sure, I'll take a, a piece of it and you might want to add to it. So tribes are able to um, expand their land holdings within their borders. One of the ways um, they do that is, like I said earlier, purchasing private property, um, but they can also expand their borders um, with land adjacent. So, you know, if you buy a parcel of land that is just outside the border, but it's touching Indian land, um, you can do that. There are also tribes that have undergone uh, land reclamation in traditional areas where they've been disenfranchised to it. And there's a very lengthy process um, that they have to go through through the Department of Interior to prove that that is um, traditional homelands. And some of those homelands are not connected to their current reservations. Um, there, there might be some space, but um, especially during the last administration, you saw some tribes, um, especially I think there was a few in Michigan and the upper Midwest um, that acquired parcels of land um, that were traditional use areas. And, and I wanted to ask also, maybe Kelsey, you could address this a little. I know like in New Mexico that um, Sandia Pueblo has been buying back lands and you had mentioned how hard it is. One, I think it was you Kelsey, it may have been you Karen for um, tribes to have the land they buy recognized as tribal land or I, could you explain that a little more? Yeah, so um, tribal lands that are within the borders of the reservation are actually held by the federal government on our behalf. So it's just this really weird um, kind of big brother our great white father out in Washington, um, where over case law through the years, we were deemed to need um, the assistance of the federal government. We're technically wards of the federal government. So they hold the land on our behalf. So when we reclaim land, we have to petition the Department of Interior to make it a part of our reservation. Um, we have to do um, environmental assessments on it and, um, lengthy amounts of paperwork. It actually requires you to have some fairly technical um, land management staff as well as legal counsel um, and trace the property. Um, and then the, the federal government can say no, and then you just hold it in fee status or they accept it and it becomes a part of the reservation. So do they have any jurisdiction legally over that land if they own it, but it's not gone through this federal process? Yes. So all tribal uh, law will apply to any tribal land holdings, whether they are fee simple, private lands that they've acquired, or fee lands, or um, excuse me, trust lands that are already held by the federal government, or their allotment lands held by individual Indians and or families um, that was bequeathed to them under that Dawes Act. Okay. I don't know if... Um... Kelsey or Miriam, you want to add anything to this discussion? I'll um, just jump in and complicate it even a little bit more. I mean, I think that there are some straightforward answers to the question of how do reservations get bigger. Um, and and uh, Karen's answered the question by saying land can be purchased and put into trust. It can be given to a tribe and put into trust or just purchased or given and not put into trust. Um, so those are uh, sort of ways under Western law on that uh, tribal lands or reservation lands can be made larger. Um, I will go back to um, 
sort of, I, I can't remember the exact way that Kelsey put it, but she had a really nice way of saying that the, there are these reservations are these federally recognized, Western recognized ways of thinking about what native lands are. But if you think, if we kind of go to away from the idea of reservation to the idea of native lands, I think there are lots of ways that those can be expanded. And we're seeing a number of those things happen in the contemporary era um, where Native nations are making agreements, for instance, with um, land trusts like uh, the Trust for Public Land or the Nature Conservancy, and they're agreeing, uh, or the National Park Service for co-management responsibilities um, or for primary management responsibilities um, that might be a form of co-management, but really it's the authority of the tribe and the decision-making of the tribe that has um, the, the greatest amount of bearing in that situation. So that's not technically expanding a reservation by um, drawing a new reservation line, but it is expanding the area over which a native nation has a degree of jurisdictional responsibility. Um, and you, you see that in, for instance, the example that Karen gave with the reach of um, a tribe's jurisdiction um, over a watershed in something like the Clean Water Act or for, over an air, an air shed in the Clean Air Act. Again, not expanding the legal boundary of the reservation, but helping sort of exercise jurisdiction over that broader territory so that the notion of what counts as an Indian's uh, a nation's um, land base for jurisdictional authority is larger. Um, so those aren't technically adding to the reservation, but they are adding to the land area or the jurisdiction area of the tribe. I wanna to touch very briefly on the portion of the question that talked about Oklahoma. So for the longest time, we um, uh, sort of uh, folks talked about Oklahoma um, as having only one reservation, the Osage Nation that was removed from um, the uh, west of the Mississippi, Mississippi and the area that's now Missouri, that's now Kansas, they purchased land in what is now Oklahoma. Um, and so that was the, the reservation that they had. Uh, after the Trail of Tears and other removals, um, and, and as Kelsey mentioned, many tribes were removed, although not all tribes were removed wholly from their homelands, but after removals to Oklahoma, um, the, what, uh, the, the, the Creek, the Seminole, the Choctaw, and I'm not gonna get the full list of um, the five, what they call the five civilized tribes, um, the Cherokee, and uh, they, those nations um, were, had reservations. And it was after Oklahoma statehood went into effect that those reservations were kind of erased. Um, and um, so that we, we said, oh, only the Osage reservation remains, that everything else is gone. And so the success of this McGirt um, uh, uh, Supreme Court case for the Creek Nation and of the other um, quote unquote five civilized tribes, that's the way they're referred to in the legal literature, that's not my label. Um, their reservations are now re-acknowledged as those reservation boundaries exist. Um, I am not a lawyer, so I'm not gonna tell you sort of all the legal complexities of all of this, but it is a re-recognition of the fact that those external boundaries of reservations in a sense never went away. Uh, and um, that has, impact for um, sort of whose law applies now for people who are citizens of tribes. I would not say that that was actually making the reservation bigger. I would actually say we were just wrong all that time when people said there are no reservations in Oklahoma. Um, we're re-acknowledging that those reservations continue to exist. Thank you, Kelsey, did you wanna add anything? I think the only thing I will add is, again, that the existing US law makes it very difficult and very complicated and almost um, economically impossible for tribes to acquire new land. Because as you know, Chairwoman Diver mentioned, the amount of money it costs to have all the lawyers, all the land managers, all the, to process all the paperwork that's required to get back something that shouldn't have been taken in the first place is you know, just a grave injustice and, and a violation of, of international law and indigenous rights and something that I'm hoping can be remedied in new administrations uh, of the US federal government. In particular, there's one case we don't have time to go into much detail on, but it's, um, it's called the Carcieri case. It was a Supreme Court decision that really makes it difficult for tribes um, who went through different processes of recognition with the federal government 
um, after 1934 to take land into trust as Karen described in the trust process, which is going to be very, very complicated um, and exacerbate climate change relocation for communities that are already facing the impacts of the climate crisis. And then Lisa, mm -hmm. I'll just add to that real quick because there was a follow-up question about um, land transfers. Those would still need to go through the process of being put into trust. Um, Congress can bypass the Department of Interior and establish reservation lands. Um, and of course the court as a co-equal branch of government can make decisions around land status as well. Thank you. And I think that's something for audience members to pay attention to with your Congress people um, is particularly new legislation, uh, those that may have portions of the Green New Deal or other types of climate change legislation to make sure that you're advocating for your congressperson to advocate for indigenous rights and to maybe potentially include um, a rider in that legislation that allows for indigenous relocation and adaptation for climate events. And Kelsey, somebody would like to know, are there other tribes facing water rise? Yes, uh, so, so many, and not just even in the context of, of oceans or sea level rise. So on the Atlantic, Eastern Atlantic, we probably have about half of the indigenous nations on the Eastern Atlantic that are facing sea level rise and invasion of their existing territory lands, but also um, the sea level rise that's projected for, you know, for the total, for the planet, is going to have impacts on harvesting practices and hunting practices. So again, it's not just where, where we currently occupy of our existing reservations or territories and where our houses are, but how do we access our traditional knowledge and traditional harvesting practices when those lands and those waters and, and bayways become inundated by uh, sea level rise or water rise. So other communities, there's particularly communities in the Great Lakes, their lake levels are rising. So they're facing um, shoreline erosion of their communities. We also have places in the Pacific Northwest. Um, the uh, Kiliu uh, tribe has already had to um, issue instances of relocation for their territory. Um, Ile de Saint Charles is an indigenous community in Louisiana that's already been re relocated. And we've had Alaskan native villages already been relocated. So there are US climate refugees. So there are US citizens that have had to relocate and are officially deemed climate refugees in the United States of America. And somebody was wondering about indigenous tribes um, and their lands and their recognition in, in places like Hawaii and, and I would say Guam and Puerto Rico territories as well um, and how that's affected by um, borders or recognition as well as water rise. So Hawaiian natives um, aren't officially um, it, a tribe, um, but they are in most legislation at par with the tribe. They do not to date want to have federal tribal recognition, partially because they consider themselves an occupied territory. Um, they never ceded their land. They were taken by the United States, um, militarily occupied at the behest of corporate interests. Um, so they have resisted, um, but are they an Im impacted indigenous community in the United States? Absolutely, they have all the same impact on social indicators um, that happen. Um, they just don't have a reservation. They consider it still all their homeland. For US territories, absolutely. We have indigenous folks there, Chamorro, um, the indigenous of Saipan, um, all of those kind of Pacifica um, countries where um, we now occupy because we, had military and continue to have military interests. Um, they are not officially recognized as tribes, um, however, um, but there is um, one department within the Department of Interior that will deal with um, some of our territory issues. Thank you. Um, and Kelsey, kind of talking about tribal recognition, Somebody asked if you could talk about the problems the Shinnanook had in obtaining their tribal recognition. I don't know what year you, you all received recognition and being in South Hampton, Hampton you've, you've talked a little bit about that. But. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, it's one that I think I would probably need uh, a few hours, if not a few days to, to go over, but um, it is read, like readily available uh, for, for searching online. You can find some really great news stories about uh, about our history. There's a book that was written as well um, 
on, on the history of, of our community, as well as a, a portion of the recognition process. I will just say that it was deemed by a federal justice that our um, process of recognition faced an unreasonable delay. Uh, that was the language of the court. Mind you, that was 34 years of an unreasonable delay in the Bureau of Indian Affairs making a decision on our application uh, for recognition. Um, so I would just say that we are not strangers to the uh, p potential ways in which the United States government is, it can be corrupt and can fail its fiduciary duty to indigenous peoples in, in the US. And so with that, in the second portion of the question to Southampton, I think a lot of that corruption stems from the influence that um, affluent Americans can have and do have on, on our government. And I think you're seeing that in the current administration, the way, you know, no one should ever be able to buy uh, is the United States of America and the way in which our, our government protects the constitution uh, and enforces the constitution. And yet we are seeing that that is the case and Southamptonites, particularly those that are very well off and affluent, were not afraid to use uh, their economic power to influence the process of recognition for the Shinnecock Nation. What year were you ultimately given recognition? Uh, 2010. Um, our initial application then uh, went in in the early 70s and um, also due probably to some what we call paper genocide. We were originally in um, tribal senses of the early part of the 20th century and then somewhere uh, we our paperwork was removed. Uh, so there, that was also part of the unreasonable delay was a, a question as to um, what, what happened to the paperwork. Um, so it's, it's a very complex and convoluted case, but uh, a lot of it is heightened by um, misappropriation um, and, and unreasonable delay and, and lack of adherence to the fiduciary responsibility. Thank you. Um, Karen, you kind of addressed part of this, but does the Fond du Lac ban still have hunting, fishing, and gathering rights in that larger section in northeastern Minnesota today, or was that revoked with statehood? Um, so yes, we do. Um, it had to go all the way to the Supreme Court. Um, the state of Minnesota um, used to try to charge tribal members for exercising their treaty rights in that larger seated area um, that was shown on the first map. Um, and in the early 80s, um, one of the other tribes in Fond du Lac um, purposely got themselves cited so they could challenge it in court um, and have the courts affirm that our treaty rights are still in place. And so it did go all the way to the Supreme Court. We now practice co-management over treaty resources in that area with the state of Minnesota, along with the other Chippewa bands. Um, and then I should probably add that we also um, exercise our rights in Northern Wisconsin and Michigan as well. And kind of a follow-up to that, somebody else asked, when you were talking about within our borders, does that mean the area of the reservation only, or does that include that larger area that you're referring to? It depends on the issue. Um, if it's a you know civil regulation, um, that's within the reservation borders. Um, you know, if it's our air and water quality, it's a little bigger map um, because of um, waterways. Um, you know, we're downstream. Um, we're in a watershed to Lake Superior. So we have upstream impacts, air, you know, we're looking at um, kind of a, a radius around um, the reservation. So it really depends on the particular issue um, and governmental authority that we're, um, we've established in that area. Okay. So the next two questions I'm going to put together because they're kind of big um, and go for any of you. One is people are asking um, if, if the federal government, if there are current attempts by the government to terminate some, some tribes such as one. in reservations, like such as the one. <laughs> so go ahead and do that one and then I'll follow up with the, the last question. The answer, the answer is for the current administration. Yes, yes, that is absolutely the case. Um, they um, took reservation lands out of trust for the Mashpee Wampanoag in the East Coast. Um, you know, they um, 
were challenging to some of the other tribes. They did allow tribal recognition of some of the first contact tribes um, in Virginia, um, which was interesting. So um, we are wondering if those are some of those undue influences that Kelsey um, mentioned. You see undermining of tribal authority in lots of other ways. Um, however, um, we talked about the renewal of the Violence Against Women Act. Um, just last week, we saw that um, the EPA granted the state of Oklahoma the rights to make environmental decisions for tribal homelands in Oklahoma. That will be subject to litigation. Um, so we don't know what the outcome of that is, um, but generally the rule of thumb, and I think this relates a little bit to one of the other questions of do we cooperate with the federal government? It depends on if the federal government is looking out for our interests and through case law that goes back through the 1800s to the present, the federal government was deemed to have, and this is some really seminal Indian law cases called the Marshall Trilogy after Chief Justice Marshall, where it was defined that the federal government has a trust responsibility. Um, and that's defined as a duty of care that they are to show on behalf of tribes. So much like a foster parent, they are to look out for our interests. Um, and in this case, with the EPA decision, um, with taking lands out of trust, that, that's that violation of what that treaty and trust responsibility has defined, been defined to be through the Supreme Court. Um, so it is hit and miss um, whether or not tribes get along with the federal government. It depends on if they are looking out for our interests or not, um, or if they are subjugating our interests because they feel like they have um, allyship with other people. And, and then that would put us on a contentious footing. Somebody else did note though, if you take away the map of today's borders, that native nations wouldn't be divided by the Canadian and the Mexico border. Um, and Absolutely, yeah. yeah, that's just a fact. So we only have a couple more minutes and I'm gonna end with a question. I'm gonna address this to Miriam. Um, that Al Dart put out, uh, and I don't know if you've had a chance to read his whole thing, Miriam, and, but basically he's asking why when you and I did a land recognition, recognition we mentioned um, Pascoyaki and not just the Tongatum Nation, and I thought maybe, Miriam, you might take a stab at that. Um, I'm happy to take a stab at it. Um, I think that this is an issue that, um, at, at least at the University of Arizona, um, we are have um, opted to acknowledge um, both uh, nations. Um, I think that many individuals um, uh, would cite the Pasquayaki tribe as um, visitors in this uh, uh, space. And uh, that, that these are um, uh, issues that I think uh, uh, can lead to controversy, but we'd rather that they, they didn't from the standpoint of it's, I think it's been long acknowledged that spaces have been shared spaces and um, we're acknowledging the, the current aspect of it being a shared space. And I'll say in addition for me, um, we at the Arizona State Museum, I, I lost track with COVID on time, but about a year and a half or a year ago, we um, opened an exhibit of, of Yaki and Mayo Mask. And we worked collaboratively on the exhibit, developing it with the um, Office of Language and Culture at the Pascoyaki Tribe with Daniel Vega. And one of the things we worked very hard on was a map that was included in, because traditionally a lot of the maps don't show that when you get to the border of Mexico and the US, the rivers kind of end before the border. And the maps that we were able to put together with, and the, uh, Yaki have been researching is, is that the rivers didn't end, they actually continue and they crossed the border. And those were traditional ways that people traveled, they hunted, they did seasonal um, living in places. I know Al is a, an archeologist, so he's looking at it through an archeologist um, view. But if I look at it through a cultural view of the, the way it's been presented to me by the Yaki, they feel, and they are researching this, that they had um, homelands. Yes, it's primarily autumn, but they had homelands also in this area of Southern Arizona that they would come to in trade, in hunting and gathering um, seasonally. And so they, 
we, in honoring of that relationship um, that we developed with the Pascoyaki um, and in honoring the stories of the people who are here, uh, that's why I include the Aki tribe in my land acknowledgement. But actually, um, if I can pull up my email real quickly, um, the, the lands here have been occupied by many, many people over time. And our land acknowledgement that the Arizona State Museum is using, and I will read it to you, is um, the Arizona State Museum, University of Arizona is located on land that has been inhibited by indigenous peoples for 13,000 years. Today, the Tucson area is home to the Tonatum and the Pasco Yaqui. Currently, there are 22 federally recognized tribes with reservation lands in the state of Arizona. So, and on that note, I'm, I'm going to thank everybody for coming. I'm going to thank our speakers, Dr. Leonard, Dr. Gergensen, Chairwoman Diver. We appreciate all that you've shared, the tip of the, you know, the iceberg in a very, very complex, um, I don't even know what to call it, the complex reality of Native life. You have to be a lawyer. You know, <laughs> it's, it's so complex. And, and, you know, just what you were trying to explain, Dr. Leonard, about your own nation. And, you know, and then when you put on top of it, the climate change and the, and the water citizenship, and, and you look at that water map and you realize how we're all connected and it's waterways that connect us. Um, and we have to take care of this because water is life. So um, thanks everybody and have a good evening. <laughs>